Good afternoon and welcome everybody uh, to Top Shelf Tech with the Instillery. My name is Christina McKenzie and today we are talking to Dan Wilkinson, Chief Technology Officer, Fidelity Life Insurance. Hi Dan, how are you? Thanks for being here today. Hey Christina, great to, great to be here and thanks for having me on. Looking forward to the chat. That's a pleasure. Hey, um, so first of all, congratulations on the CIO Summit Award for Team Culture. You must be stoked. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. It's a great testament to the, the trust that the team have placed in, in me and my leadership team um, as we've, we've put in place uh, some new ways of working and some new structures in the team and really tried to try to lift the feeling of what it's like to come to work for Fidelity Life, but particularly in the technology team. Yeah. Oh, and that's fantastic. So I guess it's a great se segue, Dan. Can you just give us a little overview of your role, how long you've been in the role, um, sort of how you got got to where you were today? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so this is actually the first time Fidelity Life has had a chief technology officer role um, and a, a sort of a presence on the executive team um, with sole responsibility for technology. It's always really been part of someone else's role, which is um, an important development, I think, and, um, and a, a recognition by the CEO at the time that uh, technology really deserved a seat at that strategic conversation. Mm. Uh, and that's um, that was a big part of me joining the business was was um, knowing that. Um, I've, so I joined. I've just ticked over three years now. So I, I joined in late 2017, um, and um, it, it was it was uh, the job was sold to me as um, oh yeah we have a few legacy problems just like anybody else. But um, that turned out to be a massive understatement. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we've 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 come a long way since then, um, and um, it's really testament to the the amazing capabilities that I have in my team and the the network of partners that we've built up uh, since I joined. Um, that we've managed to make as much change happen as we have at Fidelity. We've still got a long way to go yet, but we've we've made some real wins lately. Fantastic. So, talk to me a little bit about the massive understatement. What was the culture like when you walked in there? And you and please be brutally honest. I, I, I will. I will. Um, and it, look, it's actually it's a really great place to start the question because um, yeah, we had legacy problems. Everyone else has legacy problems, really. You know, one kind or another. Um, but it was the culture in the team and the culture around technology in the broader business that I think was the thing that really needed fixing the most. Um, because without that, we didn't really have the license or the capability to fix any of the other things. Um, so what was the culture like? Um, it was really difficult. Um, we, we had a team of about 30, 30 odd people um, who as individuals were doing nothing wrong, really. Um, uh, they were just doing it as individuals and often across purposes and in conflict frequently with the rest of the organization. Mm. Um, and it really was how that team was set up. And, and I suppose how over the generations that Fidelity Life has been in existence, how technology had grown to be something to be mistrusted, um, something that was painful, that was expensive, that was slow. Um, and, um, and as a result, you know, those individuals in the team started to perhaps be the face of that to the broader business. And um, that becomes really challenging, really challenging to come to work when you know that people feel about you like that. And it's really difficult to change that perception from, from an individual's perspective. So um, one of the first things that we did was we, we sort of arranged the team into a, into a flatter structure with larger groups of people um, and really started to gain some alignment and clarity in terms of what we were here to do how we were going to do it, and then start to take that to the broader business in small, sort of easy to swallow packages that could really give a sense of proof that we were changing and that we could be different and we could add value and and, and be be the sort of source of inspiration, I suppose, for, for certain parts of the business. So it was a, a it was a tough road, um, but um, it, it was very rewarding once we started to get a bit of traction. And how long do you think it took in terms of adding that iterative value to the business and ch changing people's perceptions? And it sounds like not just of mm -hmm. from the outside in, but actually from the inside out too. So people's own perceptions of themselves working within technology. How long would you say mm -hmm. from changing that uh, mode of operation was it before you saw some differences? Um, I'd say it was probably about six months. Um, I joined at the end of September thereabouts and um, it was really until about March the next year um, that I could sort of hand on heart say we're we're starting to move the needle, um, and then I'd probably say it was about another six months after that um, that we could honestly say 
we're really going in, going somewhere now. Um, and I, th I think a big part of that first six months was the thing that we settled on, that we sort of said, this is the, this is the thing that's going to lead us out of here, was um, robotic process automation. Um, which for us was a way of saying, look, this is a small, this, this can be a very small initiative. It's the sort of thing that can take a lot of the pain of legacy away. And we can work in small targeted, uh, you know, engagements with, with certain parts of the business that are perhaps more open to this than others. Um, and that gave us the ability to deliver stuff quickly. You know, it wasn't, it, it just, it's not always a six month technology project. In, in some cases, we can do this sort of thing in a couple of weeks. And we can change the lives of an entire team by taking out days and days of effort from that team in sort of stuff that they just hate doing. It adds no value. It doesn't grow them as people. It's just data from here goes into here and do that a hundred times every Monday morning. And we can take that sort of stuff away. So that that was um, that was a great sort of first step in saying, actually, maybe engaging with technology at Fidelity Life could be a positive thing. Yeah. Um, and then building on that and, and sort of scaling that sort of initiative out, not necessarily just in RPA, but maybe looking at some CRM initiatives, maybe doing some work with legacy um, and sort of getting more out there as part of the broader business rather than as this team of the IT people in the basement, you know. Mm -hmm. And how did you, um, I guess, it's, it's a big role, big job. Uh, you were attracted to it because of that. Certainly challenging. I um, mean, you and I first caught up probably a, a year ago now actually um, yeah. and, and you're in a different part of that transformation then what did you draw on in terms of uh you're coming in you've got this big remit you've got a real challenging culture uh you know and i know some of the legacy that you were faced with so some real legacy issues in that technology space um how do how did you know where to start and, and i guess what tool what tools did you have in your tool belt um, I think I'd probably start by um, saying, yes, culture is a piece of this, but culture um, doesn't really exist without, um, it doesn't really usefully exist without alignment and a clear alignment to a really powerful strategy and a purpose. Um, because, you know, it's great to have a lovely place to work, but um, without that loveliness and the energy that comes with that being directed to power yourselves towards a very clear purpose that we all buy into, become, that becomes a real challenge. So um, for, for me, that, that first step was making it abundantly clear um, what our business was here to do and um, why, why we were here to help with that as a technology team. Um, and and there's, uh, that becomes quite easy in, in life insurance because what we do is so incredibly powerful. You know, we are there for people at the most financially and emotionally challenging times in their lives. And the vast majority of, of times, the outcome from that is really positive or as positive as it can be. Um, and from a technology team's perspective, the stewardship we have of our customers' data and of the processes that our operational people execute is a huge responsibility and one that we really, really need to take ownership of. Um, so it becomes quite easy to orient people towards that purpose. And as well as, well as that, the overlay of being a New Zealand-owned business, you know, for New Zealanders, we only operate in New Zealand, we're owned entirely within New Zealand. And it becomes something that people can feel start to feel really strongly about in terms of doing good for New Zealand and New Zealanders and our economy and, and so on and so forth. So it's something that people can get behind if you frame it up really well. And once you've done that, once you've aligned your, your people towards that common goal, it becomes very easy to then ladder that sort of back to why do I come to work every day? Why do I do this task? Why mm -hmm. do I want to do really well? And that belief that the operational people that I'm doing that next to they're not another team that's an adversary. They're a colleague who are pursuing the same goals. Um, and so you start to get that sort of engagement across the business going. And we, one of the things that we've tried to break down is this notion of technology and the business. You know, yeah. we talk, talk about the business as if they're different people. And it's like, well, I, last time I looked at my paycheck, we worked for the same company. So <laughs> maybe we're trying to do the same thing here. And uh, try, trying to break down those silos became um, something that my team and I became quite passionate about as well. Isn't that crazy though? That 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 is still so often the case that we forget that we're actually working yeah. for the same company, uh, should be driving towards the same outcome, albeit with a different lens and perspective. And yet, it so quickly becomes an adversarial relationship. Right. I personally have changed my views on. Um, I used to I used to 
say what you just said and say I hate the idea of the business and IT, but from working across multiple different portfolio, portfolios in New Zealand, I definitely think there's a, there's a place for businesses at that stage where they still need to differentiate. Um, but albeit, and I hope that's going to be a limited space and time before they you know, sort of remove that kind of barrier language. Uh-huh. Uh, right, so um, I guess I've got to ask, uh, we've talked a lot about the good stuff. Any mistakes? Anything that you're prepared to share with CIOs of New Zealand and whoever else is listening? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I've, I've, um, I've got I've got a big one. So um, the uh, I suppose as 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 a technology person and as a new leader into a business and um, you know a lot of expectations, I really wanted to move quickly, and I felt that I knew what the right thing to do was, and um, I, I wanted to. I wanted to be seen to make change. And what I missed was a critical part of the change process, which is the uh, the, the awareness phase. Mm. Um, so, you know, if, you, if I, I, I now believe <laughs> that, you know, it's, it's a four stage process, right? You develop awareness of your situation. You learn to appreciate what that really means. And then you move on to action. And then you, you step back and you understand what, what if anything, you're achieving. Um, and I really missed the first part of that. And um, I remember um, uh, talking to the team at the time within like a week of me arriving about things like CICD and, you know, using public cloud platforms and, um, you know, pure paperless processes and, and, you know, all that sort of cool buzzword stuff. And they were kind of saying, you know, digital is going to transform this business. It's going to be amazing. We're going to be completely different people. Isn't it going to be awesome? And I didn't really appreciate that I was talking at, in some cases, 20 years of indentured experience that proved the opposite was true. Um, and to be honest, they listened to that. Um, and so I'm, I'm met with a sea of blank faces. And in some cases, people just going, I'm sorry, I just don't believe you. Um, and I totally get that. And I totally see why why it was wrong for me to, to just jump in like that. Yeah. So, so if, if any of my if any of my team are listening to this, I'm sorry about that, and uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. um, but look, I think it is critically important. You know, you, as a, like I say, as a leader, you, you feel that sort of pressure to achieve when you first join a join a business or a new role, and that largely comes from within. But you just have to take that moment to pause, and that moment could last for a good few months. Um, but then, at least you know that the next step you make will probably be a, be better received. Mm. So summing that up, it would be, I guess, take the time to listen and understand before rushing in. That's right. That's right. I mean, look, even if even if what you then do is what you'd always thought you would do, you'll know how to present it. You'll know how to engage and you'll have a better sense of your environment. So absolutely, it's get that awareness, really appreciate what it means before you move into action. Cool. You touched on it just before, actually, but um, I want to ask you a question about change management. I know it's something that you and I have talked about um, in the past, um, but what I noticed during the lockdown the first time, um, and I guess when we all sort of realised that COVID-19 was coming and that that the world was going to change, at least for a while, was... um, businesses really rushed to demand of the technology teams and partners to quickly transform them to be nimble and agile. Uh, mm. Something that they've probably been, uh, you know, CIOs and, and um, partners like the Instillery have been trying to advocate for for years now and suddenly the business is demanding that we do it and we do it tomorrow. Um, and what I saw that do is remove the business case or I guess a lot of the pushback around change management and uh, the need for large scale change management to help um, help mm. customers and businesses adopt that change. What's your view now having seen that during lockdown on the importance of change management and the role change management plays in transformation projects, specifically within larger organisations, not so much, um, you know, your 50s, mm. but, the, but the larger yeah, I'd, I'd probably break this down into sort of two parts, really, um, because you're absolutely right. It's it's caused all of us to think quite differently um, about the role of technology and how technology change should be executed, I think. Um, one of the things that we noticed was that we probably underestimated our people and their capacity to change and their capacity to positively engage in change. Um, and, it, and, a, and a really basic but quite a good illustrative example of that was, um, you know, until uh, until COVID nineteen hit, we 
most of our operational processes that required a signature or a document to be approved or whatever were wet signatures. We needed a physical piece of paper to be signed by a customer or an advisor or, or whatever. And um, we moved within the course of about 18, 24 hours to adopting um, electronic signatures. Now, it's not because it's the first time we thought about doing this, far from it. It was because all the times we thought about doing this, it was such a huge exercise and needed such an enormous amount of engagement across the business. And um, it always got deprioritized. And what we found when we moved into lockdown was all of a sudden it didn't need a huge process. Um, we literally enabled the technology, had a quick chat with the user group and said, look, look, normally we'd spend ages walking you through the outcome process and making sure you're appropriately trained. But can you guys just figure this out? Um, because we think you're really smart and there's lots of resources available online. And look, here are some basic do's and don'ts, but have you got this? And our ops guys were amazing. They basically had a look at this over the next couple of hours and came back and said, don't worry, we've got this. And, and I thought, wow, that would have taken us months. <laughs> you know, so I, I think that was one, one takeaway from, for me, certainly, is we, we underestimated our people's capacity for change and their ability to engage. And I think the second piece is um, that probably illustrated by that little anecdote as well is um, I think we, we are learning to empower more um, and to enable more and to sort of not necessarily feel like we need to uh, wrap everybody up in cotton wool and maybe spoon feed everybody everything. Um, so what happened there was it wasn't just about saying, can you guys figure it out? It was saying, I trust you to do the right thing with this um, mm -hmm. because you're smart people and you get our business and you get the sensitivities around it. Um, and I think that's something that I've really noted develop in our business and in lots of other businesses as well, is that increasing notion of empowerment and enablement you know, pushing decisions to where the information is, letting people be their smart, clever, innovative, um, you know, uh, intelligent selves. And um, I, I'm, that's something that I think we should all be really pushing and celebrating. Mm. I agree. I think um, one of the things I think one of the most uh, sort of shocking stories that I heard when we were first allowed out of lockdown um, was talking to a friend of mine who's a, a digital manager and their company had never, ever, ever enabled flexible working. There was no such thing as working from home. And it was actually the first time in his career that he'd ever had to lead or manage a team that he couldn't see every day in the same office. And I mean, I you know, it's just the way that we work now, right? So it would, you know, for a lot of us, that just seems crazy. But the more I asked the question, the more actually I realized that a lot of these, um, you know, be older leaders or older businesses and more traditional businesses um, had been doing this. And I think what I found really interesting was that the lesson they learned had nothing to do with technology. It was teaching themselves about the difference between, you know, an empowerment leadership strategy and management strategy versus command and control. Yep. Um, and how much of command and control was actually just perceived command and control because you can see someone <laughs> it makes you feel safer, but actually it doesn't change the reality of whatever's going on. Um, yep. so that that's fantastic. Hey, so I want to ask you a pretty big question, um, but we've got elections coming up. We've got a lot of talk about the transformation of New Zealand and the opportunity that, that a good crisis can bring. Um, so I want to pose the question to you, Mr. Wilkinson, if that's okay. If you could change New Zealand in one way, if you could transform our country in one way, what would it be and why? Um, this this is a this you're right. This is a massive question, um, and, um, and I'm going to I'm going to try try and not to stray too far into the realms of politics here. But um, one of the things that I loved about New Zealand when I first visited, because obviously I'm, I'm English, um, I've been here for 11 years now, nearly, um, was um, how uh, how much of a community feel there was across the entire country. Um, how ready people were to engage in conversation, how ready people were to help each other out. And um, that I, I thought was just wonderful and, and a relatively unique thing across the globe. And it would be wonderful for me and I think transformational for this country if that was reflected more in how we chose to run the country. Um, and I suppose what I noticed really was that willingness to put other people before oneself, that willingness to put other people before one's perhaps own profits and one's own financial standing. Um, it, it would be wonderful if that was better reflected in the macro 
of New Zealand as opposed to just those one-to-one -one interactions because I believe it's a fundamental part of who New Zealand are um, is that that humanity, that empathy, um, and that sense of, of community. And that's, I mean, you know, we, we, during lockdown, we talked about the army of 5 million um, and or the team of 5 million. And um, it is so true. It's very much how this this country feels when it's operating at its best. Um, so I, I, that, that, that's the one thing that I'd probably, I'd probably put out there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a, I know that it's, there are people who don't feel that way, but um, I, um, I feel quite strongly about that. Fantastic. Thank you. I did not expect you to take it there, but I love that you took it there. <laughs> I was expecting any number of, um, of technology transformations or big projects, but no, you went straight for the heart. And that is probably why you were up for the award that you were on. Hey, listen, Dan, it has been fantastic um, to have you on the show today. Uh, before we go, have you got any final pieces of advice? piece of advice for New Zealand or any do's and don'ts that you want to share with us um, before companies embark on any transformation of their own? Yeah, totally. totally. One last thing. Um, all technology people of a certain age will remember the old um, seven layer diagram, um, you know, with uh, uh, I think it's user interface at the top and, and networks at the bottom. Um, yeah. If you put another layer along the bottom, that's a really big fat layer and it says culture. Um, that is the bedrock on which all of that sits. And um, as a technology person, you know, any of us can execute a really awesome, well-tuned technical delivery. But unless it sits on that bedrock of a really solid foundation and a really good, positive engagement towards technology, it probably won't succeed or it won't succeed in the long term, the medium term, whatever. But at some point it will come unstuck. Um, and I, I, I would say ignore that at your peril. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Easily my favorite this week. Maybe oh, even it's only Tuesday. <laughs> it's good to it's good to see you, mate. And thanks again for coming on the show. And we'll catch up again yeah. soon, hopefully in person next time. I look forward to it. Thanks for having me. Cool.